You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is January 23rd, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Flow Cytometry 101. Our presenters are Dr. Chitra Dinakar and Dr. David Zwick, both from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Uh, good morning. Uh, we are going to do uh, a session called uh, Flow Cytometry 101. It really started because the fellows said uh, we want a hands-on, uh, blow-by-blow discussion of uh, what to look at in a flow cytometry. Uh, and I thought, okay, let's try to get something together. So this is not everything you want to know about immunology and flow cytometry, but really it is how do you make sense of all the numbers, um, how do you flag what's normal, what's abnormal, when you need to do more stuff, uh, when do you know to seek for help, like call Dr. Zwick for more labs. Or, uh, and and uh, so I'm going to, uh, I invited Dr. Zwick, who's uh, the uh, director of, uh, and chief of pathology uh, at Children's Mercy Hospital. We've worked together for a long time on many difficult patients, um, and uh, we're always trying to stretch our capabilities to incorporate newer diagnostic techniques, and Dr. Zwick has been instrumental in um, having that endeavor. Uh, so I'll have Dr. Zwick first uh, just give us a brief overview of flow cytometry as clinicians, bedside clinicians want to use it or look at it, and then we'll go through some cases, and I'll pick Dr. Um, Zwick's expertise in uh, trying to go through them. So Dr. Zwick, if you okay. want to go. Sure. Uh, so what I'm going to cover is just give you an idea of, of first what is flow cytometry and how is it done. I'm going to try to do that in 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes or less. So um, what is it? Uh, flow cytometry basically is the, it's a technique for analyzing individual cells, some feature about individual cells that, are, that exist in solution. So whatever you're going to do flow cytometry, if you're talking about solid tumors and whatever you got to do, you got to get them into some solution before you can perform flow cytometry on it. So it's basically analyzing cells, single cells in solution. Two major components of the instrumentation that you need to know about a little bit is the major is the so-called flow cell, and then the other is the optic configuration or the optics of the instrument. The flow cell is where, uh, through hydrodynamic focusing, uh, uh, a sample that's injected into the instrument it aligns those, in, those cells up so that they're in single file as they pass in front of the laser beam. So that's the principle of hydrodynamic focusing. It's basically increasing the pressure fluid around a sample stream. And on the left, lower left is an example of a flow cell. And it sort of shows here on the right where the sample gets injected into the center of a, of a sheath fluid that's flowing in this direction here. At the end of the sheath fluid is under pressure. And what you can see is the individual particles or cells that are flowing through there are not very well aligned at all. By increasing the pressure, you can collimate this, this column into a much narrower column. Ultimately, they line up by increasing the pressure into single cells as they pass in front of a laser beam that will scatter the light or excite fluorochromes that are attached to it. So that's the one major component. The other major component is the optics, or so-called the eyes of the instruments, you know, that are looking for scattered light or for us emissions. So here's the example of the flow cell. This is the laser beam that is cutting across the flow cell, presumably aligned up on individual particles, you know, as they pass in front of it. And then that laser beam, if there's no particles, it hits this little blocker bar here that's in front of this filter, and no light hits this detector, the eyeballs, essentially, of the instruments. And this particular configuration shows six different detectors. One is so-called in the forward scatter, where if the light is scattered around a blocking bar here, it'll hit <coughs> this detector. If there's nothing flowing in front of the laser, then the laser just hits the bar and it's completely blocked, and nothing hits the detector. If a cell does get uh, pass in front of the laser beam, there'll be an orthogonal angle scatter that comes up this way, and ultimately it hits this detector. This particular configuration shows a two laser beam configuration with uh, one laser emitting at uh, 488 nanometers. And that's colored in blue. And what you can see is the incident laser beam light is allowed to pass through these filters. 
uh, there's a 488 nanometer plus or minus 10, so that'll pass through that filter to the detector. The other filter, you know, these other filters are, are uh, dichroid filters and, and mirrors that let some of the light pass through, and some of it is deflected off so that you can pick up light that's scattered in a, at an acute angle or orthogonal angle by this detector up in here, so-called side scatter. And then these other detectors will pick up the fluorescent emissions. You know, there's four different colors on here. So that's, those are the essential components. So you'll label your solution of cells with some fluorochromes, and cells will have some inherent fluorescent properties in them, and then they'll uh, elicit or uh, emit that light, and then that light is, is directed down these paths in the instruments and collected by the different eyeballs or the different detectors. You know, and I kind of liken this to, to being, you know, basically, you know, six guys sitting around all watching the same cell as it passes through there, and each has a different set of sunglasses on, so they can see the, the, the emitted light that's coming from these, but they don't see the emitted light from the other one. And so, therefore, you can use, you know, four different colors conjugated, uh, four chromes conjugated to four different antibodies, and you can get on one individual cell, you can get the whether that cell has any one of those four or all four of those uh, molecules on their surface, plus you can collect the incident light scatter uh, whether it's forward angle or side angle scatter from that. So, so the basic components, again, are the flow cell, which is the fluidics for aligning things in the single cell, a laser beam that interrogates the cells, and it results in scattering either incident wavelength or exciting fluorochromes that are captured on there. The optical system consisting of filters and light detectors for picking up the scattered light of incident wavelength, uh, so-called forward or side scatter, or, or, or for us, and emissions from the bound fluorochromes. And then there's computer processes that are in here. And these things are, are for processing the signal so that they can capture the intensity of the light that's either emitted from an individual cell and, and some other pulse characteristics. But essentially, that's what the most of the essential part is, is to process of these signals. And then it, wrap, it will record the signal, signal properties you know, for each individual cell. So you can imagine. You know, as one cell goes through there, with all those detectors, it records for cell number one, it'll record the forward scatter, the side scatter, the red emission, green emission, orange emission, you know, et cetera, you know, however many detectors you've got there. Then it goes, the next cell comes through. So it'll quickly record all that. The next cell goes through, records all that. So it can literally do 10,000 cells in less than a minute, recording all those that information from each individual cell. And it records it in so-called list format, which, you know, data. Uh, and then that list mode data that's basically, as I said, it's a list of all the cells that you collected data on and what each of those has. You have to bring that up and you have to look at it in, a, in some way that you can interpret the data. So the data is in the instrument in a list mode format. The software then will present the data to the observer so that they can interpret the data. So common, commonly done on peripheral blood, you know, for, for phenotyping results would be 45 would be in each of the tubes. CD45 is a pan-leukocyte antigen. And it's very useful because the CD45 binds different cell types uh, differently. So that lymphocytes bind at very bright, and, and on the x-axis is fluorescent intensity. On the y-axis is side scatter intensity, or the, the, the brightness of cells that have been picked up by that side scatter detector. So if you look at all purple blood cells, lymphocytes are very bright, and they, they're very low side scatter. They don't have any granules in them. Granules essentially are a feature that increases side scatter. Monocytes have more granules in them, but they're a little less intense for 45. So consequently, they're kind of centered a little bit lower than the lymph. And the granulocytes are up in here. And so we could, uh, we could li literally you know, uh, say, I only want to look at the lymphocyte population based on 45 side scatter. And, and gate on this population. And this is the only one I want to see the other three parameters that might be in there. The, the, the other three parameters might be uh, uh, CD5616, uh, which is CD3. CD3, a good T cell marker. 5616 be a good marker of NK cells that exist in this lymphoid population. So we can literally you know, analyze just this population, not this or this and this. So this is, this is so-called gated analysis you know, of the data. Uh, and and so software can look at gated data or ungated data. This is clearly all ungated data, but this is where we set our gates on. And this, this histogram is gated data. And we can look at either single parameter or dual parameters. Here we're looking at dual parameters on the individual cell populations, whether they express just CD3 only, or do they only express CD40, 
uh, CD5616, or do they express both markers here? So again, this is fluorescent intensity for FITSI, uh, which is labeled with uh, CD3. This is uh, fluorescent intensity of the orange emission, or which is labeled with FITSI5616. Uh, and we know that NK cells, they are, do not express surface CD3. They're not T cells. So they should be on this side of this axis. Here's our T cells. And, but they do express CD56 and CD16. So they, these are our NK cells. And that's where they come from. And so from this analysis, we can extract out the data to know the proportion of things in our parent grid gate that are natural killer cells or that are T cells or T cells that are so-called natural killer type T cells that do express CD5616. Uh, so this is the this is the gated analysis that I'm showing you down here. You can look at single parameters. We're looking at dual parameters here. We could do sequential gating where where we're saying, well, the cells have to. In, in one sense, we have done some, done some sequential gating because we looked at 45 side scatter, we, and we gated on this population, and we only wanted to see uh, the, the lymphocytes how they expressed these uh, marker combinations. We could then go to the next one. We could say, well, I only want to look at these this population here. And I want to see what my third color looks like on this population. So I, I could gate around this. And I could set up what's called a sequential or Boolean gate and look at only those cells. But that's just the power of the analysis. Here's another example. Again, this is a gated analysis on the lymphs only. Therefore, they're kind of colored orange or, or red like this. And this looks at uh, CD3 here. This is CD19. So this is a T and B cell analysis, total Ts and total Bs. And this is the 56163 that we saw previously. Uh, here's one for the CD3, 4, and 8. Uh, this is 3 on this axis. The x-axis, the y-axis here is CD4. Uh, and this is, sorry, this is CD8. And this is CD4 on this. So these are our, our cytotoxic T cells because they express both CD3 and CD8. These are the helper T cells because they express both CD3 and CD4. Uh, so, you know, one of the things people might oftentimes ask and say, well, I only want to, well, just give me an analysis of T helper cells. Well, unfortunately, we do have to do 45 in the tube so we can only look at the, the lymphocyte population. We have to do CD3 because actually CD4 is not entirely specific. You can kind of see there's some CD4 events over here that are CD3 negative. Oftentimes, some of the uh, uh, monocytes or macrophages that are in a sample, they actually fall within this gate and may show up as CD4 positive cells. So you know, we're, we're really doing multiple uh, markers, even though we may do a single cell CD4. Yet. So, so your T helper cells would be 3 positive, 4 positive, 45 bright positive. But we don't tell you all that information. We just give you the answer that you want. So the clinical applications you know, for this are, are numerous. Uh, research applications far outnumber clinical applications. And I just put together a little list for you for phenotyping, total T's, total V's, NK's, sort of looking for, you know, the number of, of uh, uh, total, you know, immune surveillance. There's also, this is where we, all, by flow, we also get our naive memory T cells or naive memory B cells, a similar sort of analysis. We can also do tests for chronic granulomatous disease it's, or leukocyte adhesion deficiency or so-called, what's the other name for that? Um, lazy leukocyte syndrome, which is CD, uh, uh, 11B, CD18 uh, deficiency. Uh, monocytes can be tested for paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin area testing. This is the uh, uh, anchoring uh, proteins and stuff that are deficient. We use it all the time for phenotyping leukemias and lymphomas, and it's useful for not only establishing lineage, but there's subclassifications sub that have therapeutic differences, plus there's prognostic differences based on that. It's used for monitoring transplantation. Uh, for how effective some of the anti-rejection therapies are. Uh, you can me measure ploidy by the complex of DNA content, or you could do cell cycle analysis with flow, quantifying the cell proportion of cells in your sample that are in the S phase. And uh, we can quantify a whole bunch of other cellular biochemical constituents. And it's used for measuring these you know, T helper 1 and T helper 2 subset. And then lastly, Dr. Dinakar asked me to give you just a, just a quick overview of cluster differentiation. And where, where this term arose from was um, back at, uh, in the 70s when they first developed the technique for, for developing monoclonal antibodies, the, the so-called hybridoma cell lines. Every researcher in the country was developing all these monoclonal antibodies. And they were 
defining their specificity for what they really bound to, what they didn't, and and unfortunately, you know, at that time, you know, each each researcher was doing their own work and kept, kept naming their own antibodies, names that were very very confusing, and and sometimes they were actually the same antibody, another had the same specificity, another uh, researcher across the country or not some other country had uh, had discovered, but they never knew that. They never knew that they were talking about the same thing. So. Back in the early 80s, this group of, of hybridoma and you know, monoclonal people all got together and started a series of workshops where they brought their antibodies with them, and they would characterize these antibodies as a group to see how much reactivity was shared between them. And ultimately, they, they came out to defining you know, these, these commonly bound sites as, as CD molecules or clusters. They're, they're basically antigens you know, that are on, on cells. They're, they're all interested in leukocyte biology. And so they developed this nomenclature, you know, called CD cluster differentiation. And they would have a series of these workshops. The last one was in 2010. And they've so far designated 363 different CD molecules. That's where word CD4, CD8, et cetera, comes from. And really, I don't want to take much more time because I know there's a lot of stuff to talk about. But I, th I listed down here at the bottom a reference site, a website that's the, uh, the, uh, the, the human differentiation, human cell differentiation molecule organization that holds these workshops and they publish their results and you can get a lot of this information on this particular website if you want to read more about it. Right. Okay. Thank you. So um, really what we're looking at is um, cell cytometry depends on the total white count, right? So the CDC this is done separately and flow cytometry looks at those cells and tries to use color to differentiate them and mark them and try to put them into subsets. Um, so remember that, that we have to also always look at the CDC diff. So different um, CDs, because that's what makes it confusing, trying to remember what the CDs are, what the subsets are. So Dr. Zwick put the slide together. Um, and what I'll do is I'll show you this and we can come back to this. So if you look at this lymphoid cell maturation, uh, which I got from that website. Um, and this is where, where it becomes confusing. Uh, you can see that the bone marrow, you have the hematopoietic stem cells and the lymphoid progenitor cells. And then if you come down, so that's CD34. So when you see CD34 positive on flow, you know it refers to a stem cell. So it's like the absolute parent cell. I wouldn't look at CD133 and those numbers. We usually never see those. We see CD34 sometimes, especially if you have a patient you're sharing with Hemonc. So you come down that, you see CD3 and CD2 as the next important numbers. And of those, CD2 is a pan T cell marker. Is a pan, is the, um, it is positive for T cells, thymocytes, and NK cells. So it's the overarching. Positive. So in your flow, you'll see CD2 first. Then you'll see CD3, which is a T cell marker, and also found in thymocytes. And Dr. Zwick, jump in if you think that you need to add anything. Now, but that's how we see it on the flow, and we need to you know, add up numbers and make sure that they all fit in. And then you have the T cells that separates out, and then the B cells. And we know the B CD19 and CD20 are the B cell markers. And for the T cells, you have the CD4, which we commonly think of as helper, the CD8 as suppressor. And we used to have only NK cells in the past. And of course, now we have NK cells, which are CD56 positive. Note, they are not CD3 positive, right, Dr. Zwick? Mm -hmm. So the CD16 slash 56 pure NK cells are not CD3 positive. So you will not see that under the CD3 column. But you do have NK T cells which have CD3 plus and CD56 plus. So it's a little confusing, and you have to look at that part, too. And then there are um, regulatory T cells. And why well, bring that up is you'll see some cells which are CD25 positive on flow. Uh, a CD25 is the IL-2 receptor alpha. You know, and interleukin-2 is a marker of T cell activation. So that's a T cell activation marker. And you'll also sometimes see these HLA, um, DR, right, Dr. Zwick? Mm -hmm. And those are also markers of activation. Is that a B cell marker of activation? Well, it's, it's a constitutively expressed on B cells, B -cells. but it's, it's an activation marker on T cells. T cells, too. But now, the CD45, 
is that again overarching? Would that be over T cells, B cells, and K cells? Yes. The right? CD45 is leukocyte common antigen by all of them. Okay, so it's in all hematopoietic cells, including thrombocytes. Um, so it's the which CD45, CD45, the tyrosine phosphatase. Not thrombocytes. Not because I saw it here. No, no it's, 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 not on, it's not on red cells and not on platelets. Okay, so, so it's, it's only on all leukocyte cells. Yeah. Okay. So, and another thing that's not here would be monocytes, which is CD14. Okay, so these are all the different cells, and you'll see different numbers in slow, and sometimes I know pathologists have it packed, or I would get extremely confusing to figure out. So let's go back here and see. So CD3, again, is a pan T cell marker. CD4 is helper T cells, but you're saying monocytes can have it too? Yeah. I see. That's why we use three with four, so we can say so they're definitely. What's not mentioned on the floor and used to be there before, you know, just be CD3 plus CD slash CD4 plus, but now you just put in CD4 or CD8, presuming it's a subset of the CD3. The CD25 is a two receptor, and we didn't go into CD45 RO, you know, memory, and CD45 RA for naive. We can do those tests. I much don't have examples today, and that's for a later date. But that's how the newer tests we can use to look at maturity of the cells and are they skin or not type uh, approach. And then you have the B cell markers, CD19, highly specific. CD10, we don't really, we are not that involved in. It is involved in, um, in leukemias, and the heme on people do that. CD20 is a mature B cell marker. And CD21 is also B cell. It's not commonly seen in the flow that we do, but it is the EBV receptor, and it's a board question. And you know, CD4 is the HIV receptor. Obviously, you know that. The natural killer cell markers. So these are NK cells, not NKT cells. So they are CD3 negative, but CD16 and CD56 positive. Remember, was it the NKT, which was CD3 plus and CD56 plus, because you're going to see both on the flows. And then you have the granulocytic markers. Really, we look at CD14, right, mostly on the flow? For monocytes, yeah. For monocytes that you usually find, and I'll show you some. So you know, if you get this sort of clear, it makes it a little bit easier to approach flow, because you will see all these as percentages, you know, and then absolute numbers. So the absolute numbers are calculated off the total white blood cell count that you get on the CDC tip. Right? Yes. To add that's, a, that's a good point, you know, is that when we give you absolute numbers, which are really the meaningful information, percentage numbers can be very confusing because, uh, like in the old days when you used to use, ah, you have to have your CD4-8 ratio for HIV patients because HIV traditionally has a very markedly reduced 4 to 8 ratio. The problem with that is a lot of patients would have very markedly reduced 4 to 8 ratio, but they were infected with things like Epstein-Barr virus. And what that does is that causes a marked elevation of the cytotoxic CD8 T cells. And the four cells were not so much changed. And consequently, the ratio got inverted. You know? So it's very confusing. And I kind of always encourage you to look at it. Look at the absolute numbers so you know quantitatively what's, what are the real changes. And you don't get caught up in some of these, making some of these confusions. Yeah. confusing conclusions that might be wrong. You know? So the absolute numbers are certainly important, like if you're looking at CD4, more than 500 for your bacterium prophylaxis, that kind of stuff. But relative numbers are also important, and I do want to stress that, because in some patients we follow with sepsis, let's say, and they say roll out immunodeficiency. When the overall white cell count number is low, every number looks bad, and you're like, is this kid? But if you look at the percentages, and they're not falling into any of the skid patterns, you may uh, just say, let me hold on and wait and repeat the test and see what happens to the, so, uh, to the cell numbers. And often you find the percentages are in normal ratios. And then uh, when the overall white cell count comes up, everything looks great again. And you didn't need to jump in and start this patient on IVIG or other things. So both are important. And I would just always say, look at both. Both are really important. Um, so with that, um, <clears throat> Let me ask Dr. Zwick if I got that right then. On the right side, I put little boxes. So CD45, <clears throat> here, for example, if you look at this flow, and uh, this, so if you look at this flow, this is the total white cell count, right? Yeah. And everything, and this is taken off your CBC disk. Right. And 
the lymphocytes count, um, the percentage of lymphocytes in that CBC dip was 40%. So the absolute is about 4691, which fits very nicely in our range. So the child has normal leukocyte, uh, lymphocyte count, which is what we would first look at. The next number to look at is CD45, which is a common leukocyte antigen that I told you is found pretty much in all leukocytes, <coughs> so not in red blood cells and not in platelets. So that should be approximately 100%, right? And the reason it's not 100%? Uh, what, what this is, uh, the it looks like common antigen percentages is of the, all the cells that are in our lymphocyte gate or lymphocyte window, what proportion of them are CD45 positive. And uh, that, give, uh, that gives us a, an idea that we don't have junk in our lymph window okay. that's being counted as cells. Sometimes platelets will form aggregates and they'll be big enough that they fall into that lymph gate, you know. Or you may have unlysed red cells that might fall into that gate. And so if they do, then they're going to drop that percentage of 45 positivity below 95 percent. And that's usually our threshold, and we'll say, ah, there's something wrong here. We better, we better investigate, maybe repeat the sample, see if it's not lysed properly, see if we have a lot of large platelets or platelet junk or something like that before we report results out. So it's kind of a quality indicator of the integrity of whatever is in our denominator of these percentages we're going to give you. We really want all the lymphocytes, you know, to be yeah. 45 So in other words, like when we do a spirometry, we're looking at effort, making sure it's good and not attenuated, this would be your quality control. So this should be as close to 100% or above 95% of what this week is doing. If you find it below that reported from some labs, you know that you know, there were other cells there that caused confusion. This has a CD14 <coughs> monocytes reported here as 0.26%, and you see the range is 0 to 2%. So generally, you don't expect much monocytes on your flow. Now, we are not that interested in monocytes, obviously, unless you got EBV or something as your diagnosis. Um, so we're looking at the PAN T cells. And here it is 73%. Um, so the PAN T cells, uh, again, would be T cells, thymocytes, and natural killer cells, right? That means this, not, not right, and the NK cell. So that means, uh, so that's what you get. Uh, and then you look at the absolute, which is calculated. So the other cells then would be, so that would I say then 73, the T cells plus the B cells, 16, should add up to 99.74? T cells plus B plus the NK. NK. But the CD2 does not include NK? Yeah. Uh, to some extent, it can. I mean, it, it seems that's what that part is what and, I find confusing. But it, it's not always expressed on NK cells, and so what we would look at for we look at three CD3 plus CD19 plus CD5615. That should add up close to our okay. 100%. So CD3, so I should change this to CD3, yeah. 19, and, and NK cells should add up to the 100%. And, and I only bring it up because certain situations, you know, there's elevation or decrease, and you want to be looking at that part. So I do want to for, uh, you to remember that concept. CD3, not 2 here, 19, and NK, which is 16 slash 56, should add up to the CD45, roughly. So what's the utility of the CD2, then? Um, yeah. Well, you know, CD2 is a, is a, is a pan T cell marker. Um, it's... It, well, what utility is, it's, it's really useful. To be honest with you, it's kind of a carryover from in the days. It's the same, same uh, way <coughs> marks sheep red blood cell re reset receptors. That's the, that, that the old days when they formed, when they used to quantify T cells, they didn't do it on the basis of flow set times. They used to base it on e reset receptor analysis. And CD2 is the molecule that sheep red blood cells will bind to on lymphocytes. And so it was commonly thought of as being a good pan T cell marker, but it's not quite as specific, you know, is, is CD3. That's kind of, like, okay. that's kind of a whole That's number. helpful to know. So we can mm -hmm. zoom. So we need to look at this CD45 first to do quality control. And then we need to mentally add CD3 plus CD19 plus NK to make sure it's added up. And you know the math has all been done. So look at CD3, then 61%. And absolute CD3, you know, you would like it to be in the range. And of course, you all know, you've worked in pediatrics, that you do want it to be age-adjusted range. And if you, it's not given by that flow, there are tables available. There have been senior authors who publish stuff, and you can look that up. 
and, and it becomes harder if it's a premature baby, but there are even pre tables on this, and you can look it up, at least on some of these numbers, not all. So, you, so this is in the normal range, and I wanted to start off with what is relatively normal flow. So CD3 then is CD4 plus CD8. So the total at the absolute one was correct. So the helper cells are 33, and fellows often ask, um, what do you look at? Uh, and, and the ballpark numbers I would say I use, uh, these are different, of course, of different ages, but CD4 roughly 50, CD8 roughly 25, so you get the 2 is to 1 ratio. CD19 is roughly 5 to 15, or you can take 10 if you want, and NK is 2 to 5. So 50, 75, 85, 90, 95, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. This would be good ballpark numbers to memorize. 50, 25, 10, 5, something like that. That way you'll know, and you don't need the ranges in general, you'll know. So that way if you look at 33%, yeah, it's within sort of the range, but it may be, you know, on the little bit of the lower side, and you can easily tell then the cytotoxic was, was okay, so clearly the CD4 was a little bit low, but not low enough to bring it below the normal range. But these are, again, so that means this patient has maybe lowish CD4-ish, but not enough to be clinically a problem. And that's why the ratio is not the typical 2 is to 1, the classic one. But the ratio also has a range because these variables are factored in, right? Questions? OK, so that's the clinical way to look at, you know, should I worry about this patient or not worry about this patient? It can totally depend on the scenario. If this is a recovering HIV patient, then the, all of the HIV, the CD4 is terribly important. But if it's not, it's a patient you're ruling out a serious problem, well, it doesn't seem to be a serious problem so far. Yeah? And so this one, you think that the CD4 is lower because the NK is higher? Like, the NK is like 24. Correct. So that's why you have a ballpark idea of the relative ranges, right? And you see 24 NK is higher. For example, this kid could be having a uh, sore uh, um, abscess ulcer or one of his uh, um, uh, herpes simplex viral infections. Maybe it's fighting it or something else is going on. So it would, the setting is very important, and that's why you have to have a rough idea of the ranges. But the natural killer cells are relatively increased. Maybe you need to follow this over time to make sure this comes down, especially in the clinical setting. And that does explain it, because if you remember that that's what it adds up, that's the helpful part. Um, but the B cells were 5 to 15, but 16% is OK. It's not a big deal. So the B cells remain in the normal range. The natural killer cells are the only one that's high. Uh, and the CD8 is wee bit high. So it's fine. This, I would interpret this, and I think this is a child that Sean and I saw, child and was in a setting where the child, there was some infection sort of going on. In fact, this child was worked up for what they think is Crohn's or something like that. So it would make sense that the NK and CD8 is, is an auto-inflammatory type of response and not to do with immune deficiency. We also had a real immune deficiency, and that's how we interpreted it. There's something the child is, uh, you know, fighting, and that's what we need to look at. Now, the CD25, is there a range, Dr. Zwick, for this? Uh, no, it's not, not a stun ball step, because that's why we don't give you one. What do you uh, think? It, it's mostly used to follow temporally people over time, mm -hmm. you know, so that, you know, if you, uh, you know, I would say somewhere between 5 and 15 percent is probably a normal baseline number, but we frequently see it higher during active immune responses and stuff because it's just re reflecting some activation. Yeah. Makes sense. This kid is fighting something, so that would make sense a little bit. And the HLA-DR then is similar. Would you say the same 5 to 15? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it's and they're both activation markers. If the 25 comes up, you know, if you're talking about just the, the timing of a, of, a, of a immune activation, 25 comes up before DR. You know, okay. So Maybe you could get a CRP, ESR type con concept, you know. But it's really, uh, why when these become really important is when you're following transplant. If transplant is a kid, you're looking for rejection, you're looking for all those signs, then you really start focusing on the bottom part a lot because you want to pick up early activation. That, then it becomes critically important. Or if the kid with omens or some, one of those kids with GBHD, you'll be focusing a lot on that area. OK, questions? Do you always report the adult range, or if it's a no, they're age appropriate. You always give an age appropriate. Always, the, you know, that's that's I mean, what Dr. Dinnikar gave for the percentages are ballpark figures that are kind of good to remember, just just because they're pretty constant around ages. But if you remember, 
I, I, you know, development during development from birth on, there's a huge fluctuation in the absolute number of lymphocytes. It peaks around two to two to five years of age. You get a maximum of total number of lymphocytes, but the proportions don't change that much. And uh, so, what we have to do is we give you normal ranges that are related to the age groups, specific age groups of the patients. And uh, our age groups go something like you know less than six months, six months to two years, two to four, four to six, six to 10, 12, and then 12 and to 18, and then above 18 adults. Wow. Those are the general groupings of the of the of the ranges that we give you. So interesting. So quite a breakdown, you know. So it's really yeah. important to make sure. So a lot that when you do peak to look that, at. That's a, that's a good important point, though. That wherever you are, if they state the normal range and. You know, it, you better check because they may not give you age appropriate. They may stay in normal ranges for adults, and it may not be appropriate for a kid at all. Yeah, I've seen that sometimes from labs that come outside. Okay, so uh, with that, I want to now move on to actual patients. Um, let's look at the flow first, and I can give you the clinical history if you want. Um, or I can give you the clinical history. Um, I'll give you the clinical history. just the age of the patient? Yeah. Okay, this kid, this kid was um, 12 or 13, something. He's a teenager. Teenager, if anybody just wants to look at it and just tell me if anything stands out to you. I didn't bring candy, but I can <laughs> note. Okay, so what do you, what do you find in these cells? Zero percent. Zero percent. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Very good. <laughs> All right. So this kid, a uh, very interesting case. This was one of my earliest cases when I joined Children's Mercy. I was green behind ears, fresh fellow. And um, the child was admitted for pyoderma gangrenosum, which is this big necrotizing ulcer in the leg. And uh, they had diagnosed him as common variable because his B cells, his immunoglobulins were very low. So his diagnosis was common variable, and this was thought to be, nobody knew much about pyodem again, Renosum in that situation at that time. And they were blasting him with um, anti-inflammatory stuff, uh, including a lot of T cell and B cell suppressants. And, and then I came on board, looked at the flow, and said, hey, this is what diagnosis? Yeah, XLA. This is Bruton. Look at the zero percent. This is not common variable. To, to just give IVIG, do not uh, suppress the immune system in this kid treat for infection. It actually went unheard. Nobody listened to me. That's the problem with being a fresh fellow. I'm honest. I mean, this happened. People listened and said, uh-huh, and they kept treating autoinflammatory. The child ended up with side effects pericardial effusion, ascites, um, and a lot of other complications. And then finally, I emailed a bunch of people, got the gene testing, proved it was DTK, and finally it was stopped. And we actually follow this child in our clinic, and some of you may have seen this boy. I'll tell you the name later. But this is the classic example of why a flow is super important. And just because a child is 14 or 15, it doesn't mean it couldn't have been XLA. And this was so dramatic and so nice. So again. Everything else, if you're looking at it again, uh, so 99.78, pretty good quality control. The pan T cells here seem to be very close, but the total T cells are 94%. Helper around the 50s, like I told you, around 25. So it looks good. Numbers all look good, but this was the striking thing. And obviously, these are a little bit more because this, this cell line is lower, and relatively the others have compensated, but NK cells are normal. So I'll show you this because always look at every one of these in a systematic manner because you will miss otherwise. Um, and uh, this child had been followed by one of our group people also who, you know, maybe didn't do a flow. I don't know what the problem was, but this is an example of why you have to look at every element of it and, and not just focus on T cells or any particular thing. This also kind of highlights the importance of of not placing too much emphasis on percentages, mm -hmm. you know, because like the T cells are all elevated, it's not because they're compensated increased, because they really aren't. It's just that the fractional percentage of B cells is zero, you know, and so if, you, if that's zero, then the other ones have to make up. Yet the absolute real number, the quantitative number, hasn't changed. That's why I think it's much better to just focus on quantitative numbers so you don't get 
caught up in making some assumptions or assertions about you know yeah. what, what's happening with the other cell types. Yeah, exactly. You could have been focusing on, oh my God, this is high. What's the problem? What is he fighting or something? You know, instead of looking at the other thing. So, okay. Uh, another uh, child. Um, this was, I, I believe, the initial flow um, that was done. Uh, so CD 4599, good quality control, monocytes not really that relevant here. Whoa, right? 41% CD3, 24% CD4, numbers look terrible, CD3 numbers look terrible, CD8 is low, ratio is not terrible, and CD19 looks like it's at least the compartment is increased. What are you guys thinking? It could be a digital or All right, you get the candy. It actually is a patient. This is really a complete to George. This patient we know, I won't mention the name because they are on tape, but you all know this child, Dr. Dalek, follows this case. <laughs> this is the initial flow, way back, um, which is why it's not, you know, so way back, you know, he's, a, he's, pretty, he's quite beyond his teens now. But what I want you to look at then, how do we approach these cases? So clearly the T cells were low, there's a problem. The B cell compartment looked okay. But you can see, so then how do you approach it for, uh, a, and the numbers are so low, like really? The absolute was 444. Clearly, you know, this is a skid type, so severe, you know, at least the T cell compartment is severely affected. So the four main uh, ways to look at skid is to look at the T, the B, and the NK, right? So the, prim so the, the first mechanism is the premature cell death because of accumulation of purine metabolites such as ADA deficiency, purine nucleoside phosphatase, or regulative genesis. So that's T minus, B minus, and T minus. Everything is smushed, right? Everything is smushed because it's affecting the cells are dying. There's a nucleoside problem. So either the reticular dysgenesis, so the bone marrow is totally smushed, or these toxic metabolites are killing the cells. So these are the conditions then when you get a T minus, B minus, and K minus picture. ADA deficiency or reticular dysgenesis or PNP. And you'll often see the cell numbers very low in these cases. So they're really skewed with really low numbers. The next one is the defective cytokine dependence survival signaling in T cell precursors and NK cell precursors. So only T cells and NK cell precursors are affected. So it's T minus, NK minus, but B plus, which is 50% of all skids. The classic X-linked, you've read about that a lot, and Jack T, which is non-X-linked but similar in phenotype. So when you see T minus, NK minus, B plus, you think X-linked skid or Jack 3. There are many more types of skid. I'm just giving you rules, okay? Broad strokes. And then you have defective rearrangement of in T cell receptor and B cell receptor genes. The T minus. Um, so here it's T and B are affected because it's a T and B cell receptor rearrangement. You've heard of the RAG thing. You guys learned that in immunology. There the NK cell compartment is preserved. So it's RAG1, RAG2, Artemis, and whatever in UL ones come. And sometimes the P and P can also be like that. And then the defective signaling of the TC, T cell receptor, and that's like CD3 deficiency, CD45, and you'll see that. So pretty much you're looking at T minus, B minus, and K minus, and you will think of totally smushed, okay? Or the B cell compartment is preserved, so that means it's more a T and NK cell, so it's the X linked or JAK3. And then whether the NK cell compartment is preserved, that's got to be a rearrangement of T and B cell receptor genes, okay? It's very hard to remember this, but if you get the concepts, you'll be able to fit it in when you do that. Okay. So that was um, the, the child, um, the, the complete the George who subsequently been transplanted. I didn't show you, I'm sure the flaws now are, um, I don't, uh, you know, I, I, didn't, I just wanted to show you what a complete the George could present, look like this. Okay. 
this is a child who actually presented to me um, again as a teenager was diagnosed with common variable again was an immunoglobulin replacement um, was diagnosed by my fellow allergist and uh, had also warts uh, for which they did uh, interferon um, alpha treatment experimentally there was a lot of warts and um, the child had thrombocytopenia uh, neutropenia and thrombocytopenia was so bad that they gave steroids and gamma globulin the child blew up and, and, they, did a, and, and they had to do a splenectomy and still get more steroids and the child ended up with uh, diabetic coma because of steroid induced side effects. So this child was received a lot of intervention, a lot of problems and I just happened to see the child in Poland did the flow. So again you see the CD45, look good, good study. CD3 was 76 percent I'm thinking, I'm thinking okay. CD3, 47 percent, CD8, 25, but look at the numbers. So here's the question of the percentage looks okay, but the number is 344 and 183, and this is like a 14-year-old. You know, so it can't be scared, you know, like how can a 14-year-old walk around like this? And the CD19 was, uh, the percentage was 9, which was 66, so obviously the total numbers are really low, the absolute level like on 733, this child also had thrush. So again, I was relatively new. I freaked out. I was like, what? How can this child be walking around? You know, what am I supposed to be doing with this kid? I sent the kid all over the place. So somebody went out during the investigation, did an x-ray, um, and, and, no, and also noted that the calcium was a little bit low. Um, and they did, they did an x-ray, too, and noticed like, something in the bones. Uh, and they ordered um, um, catch-22, the um, DeGeorge uh, test, fish. And it was lo and behold, the child the George syndrome. And why bring out that the child was was come as common variable? Because the B, the the immunoglobulins were very low, and so some the George can have B cell problems too, especially the ones later. On. So I'm thinking this is the George kid, but look at the numbers; it's so terrible. Am I supposed to do something? What am I supposed to do? So I send the child at different places to get looked at, including should we give. Um, the thymic extract, there was a drug called thymus, and should we give all that stuff, or what should we do? And everybody said, no, he's fine, and he continues to be fine, and he's walking around with numbers like this. So that is the interesting part of DeGeorge, uh, he obviously was not a complete, I don't know, or whatever, he, he survived and he's doing okay, but sometimes the numbers can look terrible, and you do need to look at that. But this, this child is DeGeorge. And these were also his numbers uh, at that time. You can see, the, again, really, really low numbers. And uh, he's he's, um, he's graduated from school, but chose chooses to work in his farm, and that's what he's doing. So interesting. And he continues to be on um, uh, IVIG. And why bring up the IVIG? He also has autoimmune thrombocytopenia neutropenia, which can also happen in George. So you can see. So he's a full grown all the things that you don't really hope to see in a George patient. He had all that. We're getting like naive and memory too, so it'll help you in that situation. Yeah, I don't know. Would this have helped me? Well, yeah. what would well, if if you would have had, if, it, it would be very concerning for poor thymic function if he had no naive T cells and all these were memory T cells, and that would just be an indication that this has very poor thymic function and most of his T cells are are expansion of already sensitized you know T cells that have been exposed to antigen already, and they probably wouldn't have much of a capability of mounting a primary immune response if they don't have a lot of naive T cells and stuff. So, um, so it might help you to tell you... T cells, what is the cutoff we look at the percentage to uh, the concerning number? Uh, uh, for T cells, I need memory T cells percentage. Yeah, when we do have I try to avoid thinking about percentage yeah. myself. Cause oh, I oh, what of, numbers yeah, should we look? I mean, yeah. Is there a yeah, well, when, that? when obviously when somebody's first born, they have no memory T cells, you know, uh -huh. so at birth they're virtually 100% T cells are naive, and by the time they reach one year of age or so, they probably would have. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at our normal range numbers to tell you, but okay. I, I'm I'm sort of guessing that by the time they reach a year of age, uh, they're probably maybe up to 20% memory T cells, and then it kind of progressively increases maybe to adulthood. You you might have 30 percent. Uh, memory T cells and stuff, 30 to 40 percent. Still, you know, even when you're very old, the majority of your T 
cells should be naive T cells, you know. Uh, so, you know, and there's there the indication of recent cells that have been recently released from the thymus haven't seen the antigen. And they're a good measure of the, the immune responsiveness of your host. In other words, if you want to give somebody an immunization, you better have some naive T cells circulating around. And uh, it, because if they're all memory T cells, they don't have a, they don't have a, it's an indication that they're not, they're already sensitized and they're not going to be, they're not going to have a responsive pool of lymphocytes to respond to new, new antigen. It's one of the things, so at birth you start off with almost all naive, and it's not until you get to be very, very old that it may drop below 50%. And we, when you get to these octogenarians and these really people approaching 100 years of age, they kind of start to exhaust their naive population, which really reflects the time function is basically dwindling at that time. And they then are not as, as um, they may be more prone to, to developing, you know, infections to, to uh, agents that they've never been sensitized to before because they don't have that naive population that can respond to new antigen. Oh, that helps. I, I just I have to rely on these numbers. Sure. Myself, you know, for okay, this is another child who came to the clinic. Um, she's like three years old. She was referred to me by a geneticist um, because they said, um, hey, look at her T cells. So here we're looking at um, the, the CD45 is, about, is barely 95, so it's a good study or, or a good quality control. And the CD3 is only 43% and the number was 528, helper cells was 29, 356, cytotoxic 11, 135, and the B cells, so it's compens you know, 33%, which is not surprising, and NK is 19. Activation, 15 and 3, not a big deal. So what would you think if you saw a child like this, three years old, was just sent from the genetics clinic? More decreased T cells overall. And decreased you think maybe some kind of de George or partial de George? I did the testing. Of, it's all that came back negative, but because of this low CD4, um, I'm not taking a chance. And this child is on Bactrim. Atypicalaxis like that, where they don't have, where they're not positive, but they fit into that. Yeah. Yeah, the crucial. And maybe the but the child is not exactly velocartificial, but it just seems like this child has to be that because it just fits in. So that's why sometimes the flow is sort of helpful. Uh, and, I, and and the child tolerated live viral vaccines, but apparently got the flu um, despite having the flu shot or something, according to mom. So it's just a very concerned uh, patient. Now this is um, uh, a child that I want you to look at, use your NK deal. Uh, you can see the, uh, it's a good study, 97%. But the CD2 is only 23, and CD3 is only 18%. The total CD3 is 65. That's all this child has. It's very they have any skin or something, right? Something's happening. Um, the cytotoxic cells 13%, so only 47. Total absolute is only 47. So you're saying T minus, right? Looking at B, B is 67. So B plus, and NK cells only three. Would you call this minus? Yeah, probably. The T minus, NK minus, B plus. What was that? So you say B plus. B plus. Yeah. yeah. That's low. Right, because the percentage is 67. There are B cells. The absolute is low because the total is, uh, yeah, so good question. Because the total count is only 363. Even 67 percent of 360. 100% uh, of 363 okay. is not enough to make it in the normal right? Uh, okay. So right. here, here is the case where you would, for classification of the B, you're not looking at absolute, you're looking at the percentage. Mm -hmm. So this is B plus, N K minus, N K minus plus, whatever, T minus. Cytokine, depending on that old signal. Yeah, so uh, um, actually somehow this child ended up on a, as an IL-2 receptor alpha deficiency. Where would that come? Yeah, you have to look at it rarely. Minus and K minus, yeah, yeah right. right. Yeah, I think I'm a game of yeah, I yeah. saw it too. But this was an anti receptor alpha, oh, actually it ended up being. But that's, that's what the child ended up being on flow, at least. I don't think we did genetic See, This has NK positive for that. Yeah, but NK is three percent. It's receptor. not absent. So it's sort of you know yeah. either which way it has IL. But this child got transplanted, and after transplant, you can see everything. You know, look at the numbers looking great, right? So this is a child who got successfully transplanted. 
and it's doing fine now. It's one of those kids we follow. But that's clearly a kid. You can use flow sometimes if they fall into the proper bracket. You know what you can say, oh, this is IL-2 gamma change patient. And you can put that in your diagnosis and be really cool uh, there. This is, um, OK, a child I'm following. She's a teenager. And let's look again, 98%. But the CD3 is 83%, which seems to be on the high side, 1632, so normal. CD4 is 34, which is borderline within the range. The numbers are also above what you would use for any intervention. Um, CD8 is a little bit thinning. It's high, 885. The ratio is lower, and the CD19 is 7. OK, give me a clinical scenario. This kid got transplanted to this kid. Has thrush, ongoing thrush despite that, and is on IBIG. And this is the flow that is now of the child who got transplanted. So some of the numbers look good, but not all the numbers are normal. And you might see some of these pictures. This is after transplant. Much after oh. transplant. <laughs> she was transplanted as a baby. She's now 15, 16. I uh, follow her. So you can get some of these pictures. So uh, you know, just to show you, uh, obviously, I would be looking more at these NK cell patterns and stuff when you have transplants, you want to make sure she's not rejecting chronic graft versus host, those kinds of things. That's where your attention sometimes goes in a with chronic patient. So just to tell you that we sometimes have patients like this. Can you go back to the other one for just one second? The, um, so what was the CDR? I mean, is that CD25? Like, do you expect it to be at all affected with the IL-2 receptor, if that was an IL-2 receptor one? Or no, oh, okay. that's the IL-2 receptor, like like the T cell activation. This kid, actually, interestingly, it is affected because the CD25 is IL-2 receptor alpha, and this child doesn't have an IL-2 receptor alpha problem, I believe, you know, based on slow sentences. Yeah, we hadn't done genetic testing. Yet. That's only 0.5%. I mean, I, again, yeah, maybe the ages part. aren't given, yeah, but we talked yeah. about the same 5 to 15 there. Yeah. And that's half a percent. Maybe that's why it's affected. That, you know, could be. OK. Yeah. Okay, at least you know it's not GVHD type, you know, activation, but other, yeah, more than that. It's, I mean, it's sometimes it's, yeah? Oh, it's pretty, go, you're right, go to one slide. Go back to one previous slide. This one? Yeah, this one. Uh, these are probably, yes, these results did not come from us, did they? From oh, our lab? Don't know. Because there's not, there's flags on the percentages, and you'll never get flags on the percentages. You used to have. In ours. It might be very old then. Okay. It's very old. Okay, that's probably very old. We stopped reporting the percentages just for this reason. It's very old. Some of these patients they look like, oh, you, you may, it may cause you to think, oh, wow, well, it's high, high, high. But if you look at the absolute numbers, they're normal. And I don't think you need to respond. To I'm glad you did, because that actually, I do believe it's important. I, I think it's, yeah. uh, because like I said, both are important. And for our classification, you know, we look at the percentages and not yeah. So I think both are important as long as. So what do you make of a ratio that's not quite two? And I mean, anything else that you'd make of it? You look at why it's not two. Right, but like so say, like in that previous one, both the numbers are OK. Like we talked about the percentages are different. But you know, they're very similar. The CD4 counts 669, the CD8 counts 885. So that obviously skews the ratio. So again, that ratio is really not significant enough to make anything matter, because the ratio is 0.75. So even for that absolute range, it's low, but you still have normal counts. It's under so context. So why is the ratio low? So right. let's say you had followed this child before, and the ratio was normal. And now you're finding that it's, that the CD8 has gone up, and the child has come to you for an infection or something. Yeah, it's important. You would look at that. And this child, every time I do a flow, it's because the child presented with an infection. And this child comes only when she's sick. She doesn't come for normal. So every time you, you do look at it, and that's why you have to compare with before. But, but the, the number by the ratio by itself is not anything. It just tells you what the two compartments are right, right. to each other. But you have to look at which compartment is affected and why, and what is it in the clinical context. Right. So that's what I would focus on. Um, Dr. Zwick, I'm going to give this to you. I don't know if you remember this child, but he is someone we picked up on flow for our diagnosis, our first ever case. He presented with swollen lymph nodes at the Hemon Clinic, and they, they ruled out all kinds of malignancy in him. Did you use this to pick it up? I can't remember. Did you use a lymph node flow to pick it up? 
Uh, yeah, but this is the like addition yeah. part. Yeah. I want to make sure. I want to teach them about the addition. Mm -hmm. The 99.5. Yeah. Panty cells 85. CD3 was 85. Mm -hmm. 23 plus 24. That makes 47. 47. So why is it not adding up to 85? What, so what do you think don't, with the diet? So this, Dr. Zwick and I, we are like this Sherlock Holmes. We really diagnosed this child without genetic testing because 22 plus 24 did not add up to 85. What's going on? And Sean, you should know. I told you this before. Think, think. So that is with lymph nodes, generalized lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, and maybe autoimmune neutropenia or something, some penia. Sure, and they the ruled out all kinds of malignancy. Ruled out. Also. Ruled out. This is not a malignant. So again, I point out, this is, this is a beautiful case. It's just fantastic in that 24 plus 23 didn't add up to 85. So what are the missing there cells? The thing. So, so the cells we're looking at is CD3 plus, CD4, CD3 plus, and CD4, CD3 plus. CD8, CD3 plus. Is it possible there are cells that are CD3 plus with CD4, CD8 negative? Yeah, like NKT cells. So, right. You want to open up your box? Is that possible? Yeah. <laughs> So they are. Um, so what do your thymocytes look like? What, is, what are your immature thymocytes Im like? What are they? What is your maturation thing? You have your bath open it up. You really don't have it, but. It's like it. Right? Have you heard of double negative? Yeah, negative. Double negative. What's the gel like? Like the game of Delta Keys. Because the double positive, either double positive or double yeah, negative, the, the game of negative one. So when does it, when would that happen? So you're seeing double negative T cells in your peripheral flow. You're not seeing it. This is not a thymus. This is a peripheral flow. So there's like a uh, because lymphocytes are not they're living. The thymocytes are not dying. What condition is that? Autoimmune lymphoproliferative mm -hmm. syndrome. Oh, okay. Okay, so that kid we picked up, this was one of the first, what, I'm ta what are we talking, 2002 or something like that, somewhere like that, something like that, and this is very new, not really new enough, and he picked it up, and then we talked about it, and then we did the definitive testing, and I think it was fast like end. So this is where you do, that's why from the beginning I wanted to show you the math part, you know, in your mental thing, do those things, because otherwise, if, you know, you're looking at 85, you know, 23, not 24, 24. You know, you, you wouldn't have picked it up if you did not add it back up there. Um, and the, the ratio is low, but, you know, so do that math, and that's how we picked it up. And I found out that this, uh, let's see here, this is 84, CD3, and this is 32 plus 44 is uh, 76. Again, not adding up. Okay, this is yet another case apparently that's very recent that Dr. Wickland sent to me, who also has HLH now, but that's not related to this. But again, what what should it be? When is it abnormal? What percentage you know, missing? Normal, missing? Anyway, and four is CD4 plus CD8 should add up to CD3 plus, plus usually minus about anywhere from 2 to 5 percent. So there's about, there's about there's normal individuals have about 2 to 5 percent double negative T cells around. And all those double negative T cells are gamma delta type T cells for the most part, you know? Uh, in other words, the T cell receptor is made up of the heterodimer, a gamma chain and a delta chain. De gamma delta T cells in general only make up, as I said, about 2 or two to 5% of all T cells. Some, there are some inflammatory and infectious conditions that will raise the gamma delta T cells some. The, the most striking one is patients with ehrlichiosis in the recovery phase, they may have 80, 90 percent double negative gamma delta T cells. In this particular disorder, though, all these double negative T cells, when you type the T cells, whether they're alpha, beta, or gamma delta, it turns out they're alpha, beta double negative T cells. And that's, so that's the next important step to do whenever you see a, a broadening above that 2 to 5 percent double negative range. The big question would be, are those alpha, beta, or gamma delta T cells? If they're gamma delta, there's lots of infectious and autoimmune conditions that may elevate it, but there's very, 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 very few things that will raise your alpha beta gamma de alpha beta double negative T cells. One is ALPS, another ones are patients with uh, uh, you mentioned it earlier the uh, uh, 
um, syndrome of eosinophilia, T cell deficiency, okay. Omen syndrome okay. is another one that will raise it. You know, but, uh, okay. So this, again, Dr. this patient was diagnosed and was all over the place from Kawasaki, with ID, every consult, everything. And Dr. Wicklin gets this looks at the floor and says, huh, I know what this is, send out the genetic test, and boom, solves the case. So it's pretty cool. There are some times when you can put, like, you know, I think this is gamma-2 receptor deficiency, or this is, you know, and it's really cool to be able to do that on a flow. Not always, but once in a while we get that chance. Um, the, the actual criteria, then, to think about helps to, to get the person to do the genetic test. We don't want to know how many are those alpha beta things. Yeah, and then you'd have to do further workup. But at least mm -hmm. you sort of feel like you're really super smart. Um, I don't know. I think we're running out of time. Um, let me just see this now. Okay. This child I did bring up. Um, do you find anything abnormal? Um, total white count, 98 percent, fan T cells 82, total T cells 77 percent. So she did 77 plus 19, plus 14, 87, 91, 98, so roughly adding up. And then 77 break up 50, 24, 74, that's fine. The ratio is fine. Um, B cells seem okay, but this child is sick, getting a lot of infections. Meningitis, brain abscess, that's common variable. Okay, so just to show you what a common variable flow can be. Sometimes it can be normal, sometimes it can be abnormal. So you do want to do it though. This, but the nice thing is the B cells are there, so I'm not misdiagnosing this kid. And the flow is, so it's hopefully more a B cell issue, not so much a T cell type thing. So I just wanted to show you that in another condition. Um, I don't remember what this is, but, and also now we have these nice graphs. So in DeGeorge, I wanted to show you a sequence of DeGeorge patients when you follow their flows. You know, you can see the helper cells move all over the place, but they eventually start normalizing, and that's the whole thing, that you need to start making sure that they start normalizing, and you can look at that, and that's what I wanted to say. So um, that's really, uh, Today's talk, the goals were to give a brief practical review of how flow is performed. I'll just like showed you that. What do the CD markers stand for? Hopefully now it's more gel in your mind what they all stand for. Look at it. Um, normal ranges, pretty much take four points. You're always still going to get cases that are confusing, and the best thing is to then look at the little context and repeat flow. You're not, you're not sure repeat flow. An interpretation of flow in different clinical presentations. Two questions for Dr. Smith. When you repeat flow, what is the minimum time interval you think is helpful or needed or necessary? And do you believe flow can be affected by blood transfusions in little babies? We get it a lot. I've seen that personally. I've seen uh, myoglobin levels being affected. I've seen some. But what do you think? What are your comments? Let's see. The first question was. Uh, how often can you, how, how often what is the minimum interval? How much minimum interval do you actually have to okay. give? It, it sort of brings up, you know, the concern, which is what, when somebody's really sick, if you do this testing when they're really sick, it's very common for just the sick state to become lymphopenic, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's usually a fairly short-lived lymphopenia. So, uh, you know, usually they they recover their lymphocyte counts, you know, as you as they start to get over their acute illness within a week or two. So I would say I would wait a week or two, you know, if you're concerned about about this is just a, a, an endogenous steroid effect that might be causing generalized lymphopenia. You know, I'd probably wait a couple of weeks at least, you know, before I repeated it. And and it kind of brings up the point that you'd like to you have your greatest confidence in the, the, the association between a specific disease and the numbers being low when the patient is in a relatively baseline state, not an acute acute L stage. And the second question was, uh, what was the second question? Blood transfusion. Oh, blood transfusion. Or any kind of Well, if, if you think, well, okay, good blood transfusions, aren't I giving some lymphocytes? The answer to that in this institution and almost everywhere in this country now is no, you're not transfusing any lymphocytes. Because zero? All, zero, because, the, because nowadays all blood products are leukodepleted, you know. We, most of the time at the time they're collected. And that gives you a 99.999% reduction in the leukocytes. So in reality, you're, when you give the leukocytes, when you give a, uh, a red cell transfusion 
or a plasma transfusion, you're not going to be giving any lymphocytes. That doesn't mean that, that, that when you give them a transfusion that they may not mount some sort of immune response related to red cells, plasma products, et cetera, et cetera, and then you may see a host-related uh, T cell activation and maybe some proliferation and so forth. And, but, but I think it's uncommon anymore. Uh, it used to be very well, and it has a lot of studies to show that blood transfusion <coughs> will induce an immune suppressed state. Uh, where the host, once they receive these immune, uh, these uh, packed red blood cells, for example, they may not be as able to apt to, uh, to mount an immune response. Some in vitro studies of their immune response and stuff might be impaired. But a lot of that was done prior to the days when we look at re reduced blood products. So I'd say the level of immune suppression is probably less nowadays than it used to be as a result of that. But even today, there's still some concern about immune suppression post-transfusion. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, the orthopedic people, you know, are a little bit aware of it because the incidence of post-surgical uh, infections and so forth was shown to be greater in a transfused population than a control population that was not transfused. So there probably still is some immune suppression that goes on related to transfusion, but it's, I don't think it's as great as immune. What about effect on immunoglobulin level? Uh, well, it, it, well, there is plasma in the, in the products right. and stuff, so it can affect your immunoglobulin levels. And it, Proportion yeah. kind of sense. Yeah. So if they're given packed red blood cells, there's, those have those have a, a hematocrits around 70 mm -hmm. percent or so. So you're giving 30 percent of the volume will be plasma containing the proportion amount of immunoglobulin that are there. I see. One condition I didn't show, which you, we have had patients with that, would be a patient with lymphangic TCL or a protein losing endropathy or something. What would you predict? Would would it be fair to say that the percentages on those patients will look fine, but the overall lymphocyte counts will be low because they're getting sequestered, right? So there the condition with the percentage is sort of, it won't follow, follow the T minus, B minus, you won't get that category. But the absolute numbers will be 300, 15 to 150, things like that. I did, couldn't remember a case offhand. We've had cases like that in the past, um, right? Would that be fair? OK. Any other questions? This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.